actions for at least 15 years, probably literally hundreds of basements. And you guys know I do stuff for you too. Mm -hmm. um, so I've seen a lot of stuff out in the field. So I just want to talk about, you know, how to diagnose certain cracks in foundation walls and what's causing it and some of the repairs, which you guys would know more than most people. <laughs> um, so what's the foundation have to do? Of course, it has to support the vertical weight of the house. That's pretty obvious, but the, uh, a big job of the foundation is also to resist the lateral inward pressure. That's where we find most of the problems with foundations. Um, um, and then also it has to provide frost protection, so it has to be at least 48 inches deep at the bottom. And then of course it has to be a decay resistant material. You would think. You would think. Mm -hmm. not, However. Not, not the older ones, right? <laughs> We've seen some um, old foundations. Yeah. Mm. Um, so just some different uh, foundation types. I don't have them all listed here, but the original ones, when I have pictures of these to follow, would be your pad stones, and that's when they used to build like the log cabins way back when. They would just literally lay stones on the ground. Maybe they would try to level the ground a little bit. Maybe they'd scrape off the grass, and then your first uh, log would go down over that. Um, post and sill, I think I've seen one or two of these in my life. Um, I think uh, they'll actually drive wooden posts in the ground, and then... They'll have a sill plate, uh, sill go across that, and they'll even do a brick structure on top of that. I've seen them uh, underneath walls, and I've seen them like inside of walls in some basements, but fairly rare in the older homes. I've seen a couple in Albany, I think. Am I standing too close to this camera? No, right I was gonna face. move in case you needed a whiteboard. Uh -huh. Very common one around, we still see around here, you know, most of your older houses would be your stack stone. Sometimes they're round, sometimes they're flat. It could be a uh, limestone, also referred to as a rubble stone. Rubble stone is just a, any stone that they could grab and water together. A field, a river rock, um, rough time frames of when they used that, probably earlier than in the 50s. But um, bricks have been a lot around for a long time, um, even longer than what I've got listed there. But you know, America's somewhat new, so houses just started to be built in the 1600s. So brick has been used for a long time. Not so much anymore. If they do it now, it's just the veneer. Back then, it's usually like three layer. You know, the, the homes and buildings and all. They're usually three layer and three wide stick, and then they might fit out as they go up. Um, uh, concrete masonry units, CMU, um, concrete block. They were first produced around the 1860s, but didn't really kick in and get recognized and used more until like the 1900s. And you know, that's most of the foundation problems are those concrete blocks. Why? Because they just stacked them up on top of each other, didn't put any rebar in them, didn't fill them with concrete typically. So the only thing really holding those blocks together is any tension strength in the mortar, which is really not there. And then even the weight of the house helps a little bit. But other than that, there's really nothing holding those blocks together. That's why we see so many problems with it. Uh, poured concrete in the late 1940s, uh, that's when that kicked in. If you inspected old homes, you know, the, some of the poor concrete uh, is pretty crappy and you could take a screwdriver and chip it away and see big pebbles inside. <laughs> um, you also see they didn't use form boards back then, they used the horizontal boards. So sometimes you look at an old house, you'll see like the <laughs> wood grain from the different horizontal boards that they, they built up. And usually if you look up, you'll see those boards. Oh yeah. You use them as the joist. Oh, okay. You'll actually see the cement still clinging oh, on to it or cement So they use as the floorboards is what you're saying? They, they use yeah. them as the yeah. joists, yeah. not floorboards, oh, the actual the joists. Joist. Oh, okay. yep. It's a subfloor too. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Um, nowadays, you know, almost all new homes are poured concrete. The only time we still see block is addition. Sometimes people will use block for additions. It might be easier for some contractors mm -hmm. to, to work with. Uh, but now, of course, we do put rebar in them and we do fill them with concrete. Um, there's uh, precast uh, foundation walls. There's a bunch of companies out there with actually precast wall panels mm -hmm. and put that in. I have seen problems with that where they were under design. Uh, what we used to do construction, one of my first jobs, it's a 10 foot high basement ceiling. The walls were, we later on, later on found were only designed for eight feet. It was clay right up to the top. Mm -hmm. The walls were bowed in and they were tipped in mm -hmm. and it was a, it was a, a mess. Uh, wood uh, foundations <coughs> are allowed in the code. They're really cool. I don't, I mean, I can see it for a camp or something, 
Mm -hmm. I'm surprised they're not used more. I always thought if I was going to build a little camp, I'd probably do that because they're they're warm. You can insulate the studs. Um, they will last a very long time. Um, if the ground's right, you wouldn't want to put that in any wet ground. Uh, but what is still allowed, I've never designed one for anybody and never inspected one. Um, and I, we're not going to talk about it, but, you know, piers. You can build a... Uh, mm -hmm. Designed a couple of house on piers, and not very common, mostly additions. Oh, here's just a, like a picture of like a pad stone foundation. Just you lay your stones down, and you throw your your log down. Your old bird shot down. Yeah. <laughs> here's a smart one. <laughs> it's not flammable or anything. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a post and sill. I couldn't find many pictures on the internet uh, for that. It's funny, a lot of these pictures are from the internet. I have literally thousands of pictures, but I don't remember the customer's name. I wouldn't be able <laughs> to go in and find them. It would take a lifetime. This, if you don't, the coolest thing that I ever saw was, <clears throat> it was a camp, it was an old, old camp, and they had like these um, casks about this big, and they stacked them one on top of the other and filled them with concrete and then built it on top of that. Oh, and you cool. can see the cask because the, the, the hoops had rusted and now they're falling oh, apart. Neat. They use that as a form. Yeah. Concrete. Yeah, it was crazy. That's neat. Um, and then of course you got your stacked stone, which comes in a, a lot of uh, variety, wow. you know, stone type. And then you've got your brick. Um, and then your, your typical concrete block wall, which you guys have seen that a million times. Uh, here's an example of a precast. Um, so if you ever go in the basement, you see that kind of blue foam with the the ribs there. That's a, usually a precast foundation, and they're, they're interlocking, and they'll just lay those in place. They're not super common either. Um, there's a, a wood foundation. Uh, typically, those ones are they only like to bury like four feet deep. They don't like to go too deep for those, and then the rest will stick stick out. But you can see how you could actually insulate that. With you know, versus the foundation wall, you can also insulate, but then you're coming in even more. Um, I didn't do a, uh, a poured foundation because I know we've all seen that. I don't bring a picture of that up. So here's just a typical kind of loads on a foundation wall. So here's your your footer, your stack concrete block or whatever wall it is. Um, you have the, the weight of the house, which roughly would be about 2,000 pounds per linear foot. Roughly, it depends on the house and everything. I uh, just did a little example. If you have an 8-foot wall and 7-foot of backfill, the weight of the soil of the house acts in a triangular shape. So a medium-grade soil is about 45 pounds per foot depth. So if you're 1 foot deep and you were to hold your hand, You'd be feeling about 45 pounds if you're two feet deep you feel twice that 90 pounds so if you do 45 times 7 the weight of the soil pushing on the wall would be 315 pounds that'd be per foot of the wall so if you take the area of that uh, triangle um what i do it here this per foot along the wall that wall would have to hold back around 1100 pounds um, per foot the bottom the bottom and so it doesn't slide in would have to be you know about 800 pounds you'd have to hold the bottom of that wall and the top of the wall would be about 307 pounds to hold the top from tipping in um, so the wall has to do a couple of things it has to be strong enough to take the, the weight straight down and that's where the footing size comes into play and it has to be strong. It's essentially a beam is exactly what it is. It's a beam. It's locked at the, the floor system at top. It's called the floor diaphragm. And it's locked either, it's pinned to the, uh, the footing or it's keyed in and or the slabs poured tight against. I have seen um, walls that didn't have a basement slab and they weren't pinned to the footing and the, wall, the whole wall will slide, literally mm -hmm. slide right in. Um, I've seen a ton where the walls are not anchored they're not adequately anchored to the top i have some pictures and the wall will tip in um but if they're locked good at the top and bottom but there's not enough rebar in the wall then the wall will kind of just bow in um or you can have a combination of both <laughs> when i come across that a lot as well is the pinning for the footer relatively new 
It's been in the code for a while. I mean, <laughs> at least ten years. So okay. they, they key they the key it for a long time. Does it? The keyway does the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, or you can just put pins in. Uh, so just some typical um, problems. Not they're all not all listed here. These are just common ones. Uh, first would be just deterioration, uh, bottom of the concrete, older concrete, or or concrete block if it sits in the ground that has water. The water's worked their way into the cells, and you can you know take a screwdriver and just like chop right through your block pretty easy. I've seen that a couple of times. A lot of times you can't really see it from the inside because that's the driest part of the <coughs> And then you go to excavate, you won't even have a face of your cells left sometimes. I know sometimes you guys might do this too. People will drill holes at the bottom of the wall to mm -hmm. get that water out. And I think you guys do that. You probably pick it up with the collection system mm -hmm. after that. Yep. Um, another huge one is horizontal cracking. Um, and the wall, I got pictures from all these coming up, obviously. But... Mm -hmm. And you've seen that a ton of times. So you got you have a block and a block, and as it rotates in, it just oh, that's where you get your crack. Uh, you know, it's just from the outside pressure rotating those blocks, and it just opens up that crack. Um, then you have and the blocking. I'm sorry, the horizontal cracking is usually due just to the earth pressure or sometimes the the ground freezing and pushing against the house. So typically, you know, pretend this is a basement window here. If you get your cracks around. Anywhere in this area, it's usually from the ground freezing, but if you get it down here, it's usually from the hydrostatic pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, step cracking uh, is typically due to settle, settling, where one part of the wall rotates away from the other. Um, and tipping and leaning, we talked about, I'll have pictures for this, where it's not adequately anchored to the top, it, it'll push in. Another one that I didn't list here that I meant to, just kind of ran out of time, since back at the wall the other day when the concrete block wall went this high and then a wood frame wall was on top of that. That's mm -hmm. terrible, terrible design. Creates a hinge joint. Mm -hmm. So the wall just did this, right? There's nothing to hold that back. Um, that's a bad design for to see a lot. That's, my house is, is a craftsman house and that's what it was, a four foot foundation with yeah. a frame that goes up another 36 inches. That's more. Yeah. No, I'm and it depends that. how much weight you got on that too. It can be designed right if you mm -hmm. if you design that half wall as a retaining wall where it has a big L footing that resists that overturning. That's mm -hmm. fine, but typically they don't. Just put it on a regular size footing. This was and it can't do it. Craftsman houses basically were um, mail order houses that they. Yep. So you had a farmer in his spare time putting it up. So no, right. <laughs> no yeah. to the above. Yeah. No right. to the above. Yeah. Um, then we talked about the displacement at the bottom of the wall. That's where it's not pinned to the footing or there's no slab against it. It just slides in. Um, then we have uh, shear uh, or inward displacement at the mortar joints. I've seen that a, a lot. I got a picture of it. So there's no rebar in the wall. Maybe the bottom's locked really good against the slab. So the next joint, will, the whole wall will break, will shear. The bottom block will stay and the wall will just go, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be at the bottom. It could be somewhere up. It could be just a couple of blocks in the wall that pop through. We've seen that a lot. Frost damage, which I'm sure you guys see in the field a lot. It doesn't go deep enough. You get the freezing of the ground. It lifts the house. It falls. It drops. And that repeated cycle it can actually condense the soil over time. And that, that wall can lower. We just did a job for you guys on, on, on that. I remember I have a picture of that the one. Corner, the corners of uh, drive under uh, garages or raised ranches. Yeah, those are really... A lot of times those garages, they didn't drop the footing like they should have enough at least, and yeah. they get a lot of that. Uh, racking, not too common for foundations. I got a picture of that coming up. Um, well, what does that mean, racking? So racking is, um, the one I went to in the picture I have in here is, just as, a, as an example, uh, you have a, a ranch house where you have the garage where you, in the basement that you drive through yeah. at the end. Mm -hmm. So the third on the back of the ranch foundation walls all the way up. On the front or this other side of the garage, there's no dirt, and you got two big garage doors, right. and nothing in that face of that wall, so it actually goes like this. Uh, and then punching or shear failure is just the wall, it's, it's locked good at the top, it's locked good at the bottom, it's strong at the corners, and it just punches in. You kind of get this pyramid um, shape to it. Sometimes I have a picture of that too. When people plant trees too close to their house. Yes, and we should talk about that briefly too because I know a lot of people think it's just the root pressure that 
is pushing um, mm -hmm. on the wall, which is to a point. But when you have something very heavy next to your foundation, a hot tub, a car, or thousands of pound tree, that, that weight from that tree doesn't just go straight down. It, it creates a ball <laughs> effect. It sure. actually pushes on the wall. I personally think that does more than the roots, but just it's easier just to think of roots pushing on the wall. But it's really that weight of that tree is just, your, your foundation wall is trying to hold that tree up from coming in the basement. One thing that we see a lot <clears throat> with uh, wall failures, uh, macadam, blacktop driveways that are mm -hmm. poured right up to right it. Right up against it, they used maybe a roller or the heavy equipment well, that came. Actually, to, actually, just over time, back and forth and it causes and it pushes the mechanic it's very elastic and plastic that way mm -hmm. usually that cracks like the first or second course down mm -hmm. i see seen a ton of that <clears throat> i've seen big <coughs> heavy um poured concrete patios are like two feet thick mm -hmm. exactly and that'll it push in the wall mm -hmm. too yeah. yeah you've seen uh efflorescence which is the you know the salt held up it inside of the block and when the water migrates through it dissolves the salt brings it to the surface the water evaporates and leaves a salt stain on it um, that in itself isn't a bad thing but it's just when it gets to the point where your blocks deteriorate um, that is obviously bad and then there's mold associated with that and smells and and you don't want to finish your basement if that's behind your wall <laughs> Uh, so horizontal cracking, we'll just talk about that. Um, I love that. We're going to talk about Yeah, that pile <laughs> really good. I'll have something, I'll have something to say about pile <laughs> It's the preferred repair of all mazes. Oh, I'll just put a pile yeah. across the wall. It's the worst repair. Let's just stop right. Hey, well, why don't I just stand it next to the wall? Yeah, yeah, just, <laughs> just, just roll your fridge against the wall. <laughs> um, That's hysterical. So we'll go back to that. So we talked about the horizontal cracking. It's just that. The outside weight of that soil pushing on the wall, and if if the and it has a function to do with the backflow. In houses that have tall walls are more susceptible to it. Houses that have earth on the outside, the backfill very high, or wet soils don't have gutters, or the land slopes toward the house, um, that that kind of stuff. Uh, the soil becomes much heavier when it gets wet from a rain so and that's actually a lot of the wall blowout if we get calls for those happen right at after a rain mm -hmm. usually so they blow out uh step cracking uh is typically due to settling a lot of times it wants to happen at the corners um so part of the house is being supported well but part of it maybe they brought in fill maybe they compacted it right maybe they're old tree stumps um so that that wants to settle and it ro rotates away. Uh, typically, if you look close enough, the mm -hmm. crack will get wider at the top. There's a good example of step cracking. You can mm -hmm. almost visualize that left corner sinking and this one's being supported okay and just rotates away. And if you look at the gap, you can see it's much wider up here. And you could even, not that anyone does this, but you could even measure this gap and in this length and actually find out exactly how much it settled or i suppose you can measure the top of that wall compared it to the top of that wall <laughs> um, you see the laser level across the yeah yeah, yeah. Level across the brick and that's very very that. common right mm -hmm. you guys see that a lot mm -hmm. in, the, in the field uh tipping so there's three pictures here so it's kind of confusing so it might be hard to tell if you look down this wall it's actually tipped in and these are my pictures, and I this is taken from outside of the house, looking um, looking up at the sill plate. This is the sill plate. This is a window opening for the basement. Maybe it's this window right here. So this oh, right. the outside face of this concrete should be even with the outside face. So that's how much it slid in. So there's not enough anchorage in there, and they typically, you know, didn't do a lot of anchors. Or if the blocks are hollow, those anchors have to be set in concrete. I don't know how they get the concrete in. It probably just mm -hmm. falls down and doesn't lock the anchor. Or sometimes, I seen a house the other day, almost oh, a few months ago. They didn't have a sole plate. They just had the joist directly on the, the concrete. But tipping in is fairly common. I see that a lot in the field, too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have termite blocks on the top, too. And they... Yep, sometimes they have yeah, termite blocks. But even that, you need an anchor yeah. in there. 
Here's an example where here's your concrete slab here. Here's your bottom row that's locked tight against the slab, but there's no rebar in the wall. So this top of the wall broke loose from the bottom and actually popped in. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's the job that we did for, for you not too long ago. Yeah, um, I remember that one. Yeah. This one, I don't think it was selling. I'm pretty sure that was frost damage. I'll show you why. Um, also, it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but there's a gap here. So there's no weight. I mean, there's weight on it, I'm trying to say. There's a gap here. You can stick your hand or a piece of paper right there. It's not bearing any load. It's being probably picked up by this wall. I actually have the joist go that way. And also this wall pushed out. So that wall is kind of just free flapping. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't think it's selling because selling there still would be weight on the wall and the wall would just drop. I think this was Dave LaCroix's job. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah. And this is outside <clears throat> of this house. So you can kind of see how this, this wall is kind of out. And this is the top, best I could tell, this is the top of the footer right here. Because he was on a slope. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's the top of the footer, best I could tell. That doesn't go down four feet. So that thing, it probably, from going up and down, it probably just lowered. And the house just stayed, you know, because it's being supported beyond and other spots. So the wall just sunk because that constant thawing and freezing of the ground can actually condense the soils over time as the wall just went. It looks like there's something going on with that chimney too, pulling away a little bit. Is that me? It could be. <clears throat> It looks, I mean, up there it does, right? But yeah. here it looks tight. You might be right about that. I'm sure that footing wouldn't go down either. Oops, the wrong way. And then this Ooh. is the picture I took that's just a total <laughs> blowout Stay failure. Oh. So I just know what you saw. <laughs> the park. Is there the window underneath the opening? Or no? Just that area that was blown out? That's the end of the house. So it's a typical rectangular house, and that's the one of the gable ends. And this post is holding up the beam that was pocketed into the wall, your typical center beam. Okay. I mean, they put that in after. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that just uh, blew in. And you see there's no rebar in there or anything. Here's the racking thing I was explaining earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, again, you don't have a balanced load basically. So you have, what, 1,100 pounds per linear foot. Okay. You know, if you got a 25 foot garage, you got, you know, 30,000 pounds pushing this way, nothing pushing that way. There's no meat in these walls, so it just, just racks. This, you see this a lot, not on a foundation, on garages, mm -hmm. like older garages or barns, where it's just a huge door and nothing else. But it, it does, it can happen for foundations. Mm. Actually, that's kind of like when you design um, homes that are built into the hill, you have to make sure your sidewalls are strong enough because that, that, that could happen when you have the dirt really high at the back of the house with nothing at the front. So that's something to be mindful of. Uh, but so we talked about bad cracks. Um, there are some cracks that are okay. Um, shrinkage cracks are typically uh, okay. Um, I'm sure you guys are aware when concrete cures, it shrinks. Um, these happen at roughly every 20 to 25 feet. I've been in big basements where you can literally see every 20 to 25 feet, there's mm -hmm. this. They typically happen at the weak points, like around uh, window openings at the corner, uh, at the corner of a building, uh, at the pipe, the sewer pipe location. Um, sometimes they're their hairline, or sometimes they're like this, or sometimes they could be bad, uh, more more uh, wide, and that's a function of how much water they put in. The more water, the worse the cracks typically end up being. Um, the negative thing about these is it can let in you know air, bugs, wind, and water. That's really the, the biggest drawback. So we just tell people you know dig down, put ice and water shield over it. You can also inject epoxy. I don't know if you guys do that. You can actually do it from the inside. Right. The epoxy injection. Yep. Yeah. So you guys do that? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um I also check when I see those to make sure that the wall is level on both sides of the crack. Mm -hmm. You don't you know as long as the wall didn't push in on one side, then it's typically fine. It still is transmitting a vertical load. It's still strong in this direction as long as it's locked at the top and the bottom. 
So um, get a lot of calls for these. Just got one today. Um, so yeah, that's like pretty much the only the only crack that's acceptable. Other vertical cracks that aren't trickage cracks are typically not a problem either, as long as it, as long as the wall is not bowed, leaning, tipping, and as long as you run your hand across it and it's pretty much in line, it's it's they're typically not a problem. Uh, if you see it wider at the top and the bottom or the other way around, then that's and you mean something's moved, then then it would be a problem. And usually it's a secondary crack. Yeah. Um, when is it feasible to repair a wall? Maybe you guys have a general rule. Um, there's something in the code about it's unsafe if the deflection is more than a third of the, the wall thickness. Um, I think most people are comfortable strapping a wall if the deflection is like two inches or less. I don't know if you guys have a, a thing where you say, no, we're not going to put fiber <coughs> straps on us too much of a deflection. But I'm around two, two and a half inches, and I'll say it's pretty much the limit of what you can strap. Uh, That's the real high end. Uh -huh. You're really in a safer, about three quarters of an inch is about where carbon fiber straps will go from tensile and then they start to tear because what you're looking at after that three quarters of an inch is you're probably going to see shearing happen right that's true. very quickly after yeah. that so if you're in there and you strap it and you still could get the possibility of shearing now your carbon fiber is ineffectual mm -hmm. at that point mm -hmm. um so then we're going to just talk about some repairs so the hardest walls to repair are stone walls Stack stone walls because you can't put, to my knowledge, carbon fiber straps on them. Uh, you can't put helical piers under them. Um, so what we typically do is, uh, well, you either have to replace the the wall, support the house, replace the wall. Some people will come inside with some framework. Uh, a lot of times we've done, we poured walls on the inside. So if this is a stone wall. Usually the house isn't that high, right? It's probably more like the top of this board, say. So we'll pour uh, a retaining wall up tight against the wall, usually at the level of any window, with an L-shaped footing that's designed by its own weight, not, not to overturn. And then we'll build a pony wall on that to uh, pick up some uh, residual house weight. So the wall that we put built against the stone wall is nice because that concrete flows into all the little cracks and crevices and it won't let that stone wall come in anymore. And then we'll build a pony wall on top to pick up the floor joists and um, mm -hmm. the wall. So we've done that a lot. I don't know if you guys, when you come across stone wall damage, do you have any other solutions that you've done? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we have something that, uh, we actually have two options. Two options now, <clears throat> something called shot lock, where we create a uh, galvanized steel reinforced uh, and rebar re reinforced wall, and then so like pass creep, so you put like our cage over the yeah. stone well, not a cage, but it's like a our, our, our power brace system, and then interlace that with rebar. Okay. Top, middle, and bottom, and then shoot that with concrete. Shoot it either. Well, you used to shoot it with gunite. With you know fiber reinforced concrete, now we've gone to a pour system, uh, and now we have, there have a third option, which how is how do you pour it? You build a, a form, the whole a thing? form on the inside. Yep, very similar to what you're talking okay. about. Uh, now we have a, something else that's a <coughs> galvanized steel, and uh, um, uh, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, extra heavy duty um, uh, I beam, and a corrugated. What's the name of it? Because I think I already seen it. Everbrace. Yeah, we already did one of those for you guys. Right. Yeah. Ox, Oxhorn or Ox. Yeah, that looks like we're to me. That it's a good. Screw, we're doing that in Screw Lake too. Yeah. It's a good it's system. Nice. Like on paper and three, it just looks like a lot of work to install because you got to cover every square inch of the wall. Yeah. In my opinion, the good the labor news is looks really high on it. The good news is that you don't have to have. Uh, all kind of access for the concrete truck and all that other stuff. It's foam, right? It's, no, it's yeah, it's foam, foam. Yeah. and the main thing is that it has a vertical support component to it as opposed to, you know, right. the other one only has a lateral component. Right. No, I know it's a good, like I said, it's a good system. Mm -hmm. Just to me, it looked like labor intensive because, you know, any pipes and stuff you have to move mm -hmm. where if you're just putting 
beams, you can kind of pick and choose a little bit where they go, but it does look like a good system. Thank you, we think so. <laughs> <laughs> so though, there's an example of like, here's your, your All right. what we would do, uh, just pour something up against it, there'd be rebar in this. Um, you know, we, we try to convince them to put a slab up against it. If not, we make sure this is buried, <clears> you know, um, then build your pony wall. Well, Rich, what would you do in a, in a situation, we come up the, to these fairly often where homeowners thought, oh, geez, well, I got a brilliant idea. I got this crawl space. I'm going to make it a full stand up and they undermine their own footer or yep. they step it back like two or three feet and now they've got this retaining wall situation and now that starts racking in because of frost. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Mostly in the older homes where yep. people, they just, you know, homes were this high and now they want furnaces and hot water tanks and they've dug down. Um, I mean, so if here's your wall, I don't know what kind of footing they had back then, but if you do like a, let's see, I mean, like a two to one, you're somewhat safe, and then maybe you could do your other that gun gun height system yeah, yeah, yeah. over that. Uh, we've we've done this and actually did a, a, a footer mm -hmm. before, and when people purposely want us to go down, and then we'll have another new level down right. there, and this will be concrete. We'll do two to one, or sometimes one to one. Okay. Um, you know, starting near the bottom of the footing. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what we do. But yeah, if they dig like vertically too close to it, then oh, they're in trouble. Right and it depends. Like, they go right to the foot. Yeah, yeah, and it depends on the soil down. too. Because sand, yeah. you gotta this could maybe you have to be three to one because that stuff just pours out, and they yeah. have some stiffer soils where you can get a little closer. So it does depend on that too. So you know, roughly is, you know, we just tell them to do this, and then mm -hmm. we pour this up up against it to stop anything from coming out. Good to know. Uh, here's another example of just, yeah, there it is. yeah, I mean, we didn't design this one, but somebody, um, it's just a sound, because I couldn't find our pictures, because I wouldn't know where they'd look. Uh, Pilots are not recommended, in my opinion, for repairs, because it's, it's, it's not attached at the top is the biggest problem. It's just going to come along with the wall. And I have, I've seen uh walls after pilasters were installed years later you come and there's a crack the wall pushed in more the pilasters <coughs> away from the wall if you were able to go all the way up and with that pilaster and secure it it's the same thing as putting an i-beam against the the wall you know if it's locked in the slab it fit at the bottom and at the top but nobody does that nobody they just stop as long as they're filled right yeah that's what we do our power bracing is yeah. locked at the joists right. and locked. Right, that's why it works. That's it's why not, it works and it's yeah. adjustable. So, right. yeah, that's why that works. So. Have you seen buttresses? Yeah. Uh, Where they're basically triangle that comes off and then the wall breaks <laughs> on either side? Oh, on either side on because, either side yeah, because there's nothing yeah. in between or there's space too far apart. Mm -hmm. I was in one the other day. The basement was twice as wide as this room and the concrete wall was tipping in. And the guy had put like railroad ties <laughs> vertically. He was just like a, a temporary repair, but his dad done it like years ago. Yeah. And then like log, like telephone poles from there all the way to the back other side corner. I think it was one of your jobs. It was Chip Siler. Yeah. It was, it was pine trees. <laughs> yeah. He had, he had cut pine trees yeah. up, way up in uh, Brant Lake. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he did the right thing the... like temporarily, yeah. but it was just funny. We're going know? in next month all to right. fix that all up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was interesting when I walked into that house. And mm. He goes, I really want to get rid of these pine trees in the basement. <laughs> yeah. So they can't blame you. <laughs> so I don't recommend pilasters. I mean, if they're done right, like you lock them at the top, or if you if they're on a big footing that can't let, that won't let their pilaster, but that's just a ton of work. Mm. Um, and then you know, you guys don't need to know about this because you know about this. And I'm supposed to have realtors and home you. inspectors here. Um, so, yeah, I guess there's a problem with one I go to on Friday that was Pierre Guasami, Guasami? Guasami. Uh, uh, yeah. A crack developed somewhere? What happened was, again, I don't know how many letters after my name, but it looks like, because I was there, I saw it. Um, there was also a, a slumping component to it. So now that it wasn't just that, the, that part of the, of the thing had settled and broken, but it was also built on the side of the hill. And you could tell because the sewer line came out and had actually snapped away and was 
kind of accelerated. After you guys pierced it? No, 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 no. no. Before? When we excavated it, okay. we saw that it, was, it had snapped and broken and probably was accelerating the washout underneath the footer. Oh, okay. For that reason. And then the other part of it is now we, we did our peering, which is like this, or actually at a 2%. Mm -hmm. But now it looks like it's moving down the hill. So we we had a geotech guy come out because I didn't want to mess with that. And yeah. the guy said it wasn't a slope instability. He was sure it wasn't a slope instability. I don't uh, think I don't he know. did any borings. So <laughs> that sucks because I'm exactly right. Like, I don't want to just peer this. I want to know first. Yeah, That's yeah. why he had him come out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you guys seen the, the carbon fiber strap, so I'm just, you guys might probably know how these work, but just to, because we've done these calculations, interesting. So if you have a wall, I'll just kind of make it kind of like it wants to push in. With you got your soil weight on the outside. Mm -hmm. So it wants to rotate, it pinches there, right? And if you were to provide a tension here, that if you imagine this was a hinge, if you provide a tension, the strap there, then that wall couldn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what these straps do. They, they, they touch it. And now that force is different. Um, I think it's maximum, like maybe two thirds from the bottom of the wall, I think it's less. Uh, but essentially that's what it's doing, is providing that tension. So it, doesn't stretch it says no and then these you guys do as well yep um, so um, and then of course we have our own product which I think I showed some of you but so in my opinion about these things they are all good they all work um, the carbon fiber straps one of the drawbacks uh, you have to clean the wall right and you guys take like a wire air we scarify it. Something? We yeah. scarify it completely. Get it down to yeah. solid so, concrete. Right. So. You got to pull any plumbing that's in the way or anything that's in the way, right? That one, not as much. No, no you don't not have as to. Much. How yeah. do you get your epoxy yeah. out if you have a pipe running in your way? You just miss. It, it depends on how far away the pipe is. Usually, okay. pipes aren't right against the wall because of the frost. You know, the coolness right, coming right, through. Right. You want to have them four to five inches away. Mm -hmm. As long as we have that space, we can get the carbon. So then get it done, and then we can scarify it and just kind of slide it under there. Okay. Get it under Great. And then. Um, the guys are ingenious. Yeah. They are. <laughs> and these ones, you would have to <coughs> pull piping and they yeah. intrude a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. No, not often. These are another, I don't know if you guys do these. I, for that one garage that was leaning, this is what we did because there wasn't any room. Well, not well, not because there wasn't any room inside, because the garage was doing this. So even if I braced the wall, if the wall wasn't bowing, this brace would continue just to go along with the wall. So we actually had to tie it back into the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's a solution for that. Oh, you guys have anything like that? You put these plates. Yeah. Yeah, these yeah. are great for retaining walls that are failing too. Right. You're picturing a, a, a what we call a, um, a helical yes. tie back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what we use and actually it's called a geo lock, <clears throat> where we'll drive that rod and then find it and then put a, 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 a plate. Yeah. Right. It has to go past like you have that uh, past all the loose backfill. Yeah. Like down no, that's good angle. too. Like a dead man in the ground, like a plate or even a concrete mm -hmm. anchor block or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But. I mean, that could be good for anything. The bowling walls, um, stopping something from leaning over. Retaining mm -hmm. walls are a huge problem. Mm -hmm. I had one uh, garage that was, <coughs> actually the house was built so that you were at grade level. And then as you walk down to the back of the house, you had a 12 foot concrete mm -hmm. wall or uh, concrete wall. And that wall had broken off and was peeling mm -hmm. off the back of the house. And that's what we did. We we tied it into the because we were doing a, a whole new floor pour for the concrete uh, garage floor. Yeah. We tied it in and put a a, a slug, a dead sl a slab, Not inside. Cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool because that was all disturbed soil on the inside. But we had to do something. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then our product, which I you probably seen, mm -hmm. um, they're they're probably most similar to the carbon fiber straps, so they mechanically bolt to the wall. They don't have to clean the wall. You can't slink it behind plumbing. They also secure to the top. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just an example of a customer that put them on. We don't install them. We don't do that work, so we just sell them. This is just where we tested it at a wall. There's no um, 
use this plywood between the walls just simulating a three eighths inch mortar joint. There's no glue or anything. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, an example where we've tested it with the earth pressure on it. So the only thing holding that wall together are, are those steel straps. And then, so that's the end of the presentation and I just wanted to make you guys aware of our other products, which I think, you know, you know, you know already, but so we have the instant pudding plates, which you guys have something similar to. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have these, which I don't think you guys have anything similar to. So if you no, have any don't. notched out floor drawers, these sell very well at Curtis and online. Um, again, probably not relevant to the work you do, but if someone wants to put in some pole down stairs and have to cut their trusses or rafters, we, we sell a brace frame that goes around that. And then our newest product is a bouncy floor strap, which I don't think you've heard about. Um, so we got the L over D to, I don't know if that means the the deflection ratio mm -hmm. to reduce 35% with putting on those straps. Um, they're tensioned in place mm -hmm. with the hydraulic tensioner that we have. And then once you achieve the tension, you just screw it to the bottom of the joist. Um, mm -hmm. So we're excited about that. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, cool. Do you guys have any questions on anything? Um. Huh? I said wake up, fight tonight. You guys you guys staying busy? Holy 